as the um, as the um, day comes to a, con a conclusion, one of the things that we know at the end of the day, we've worked in classrooms for a long time, right? We start to get that. Oh, we had tacos and we had cheese and we had lots of bread and and no matter how much Mountain Dew we drink at this part of the day, we still have that tendency to have those eyelids just kind of fall. So one of the things I've got planned here, and one of the things that you can take to your classroom is movement. Okay? <laughs> movement. You don't want to move right now, but it's amazing what movement will do for you at this time of day. And so this is accommodations and modifications and specially designed instruction. So what we're going to do, we've got the objectives. We're going to look at what paraeducators should know about accommodations for students with disabilities. We're going to look at the difference between accommodations and modifications and what we should know about that. And uh, specially designed instruction, what is special. Now, a large part of this presentation I've borrowed from Iris Peabody Vanderbilt. And then the last part of the, uh, I've, a lot of the work is around uh, a, book, a new book that's, that is written about special design instruction. What is special about special design instruction? Uh, this lady, Ann Benninghoff, uh, tremendous uh, writer uh, and special educator, been doing it a long time. So we've, we've borrowed some ideas from them as well as our own ideas and what we know uh, that Brenda and I have uh, accumulated over, oh, what's this? You're starting year 40. 40 and I'm starting year 35. So 75 years of experience between the two of us working with students with disabilities. And we don't tell you that to brag, but just to say that we're old. Okay, <laughs> we're old and it's amazing that we're awake at three o'clock, right? Or two o'clock or whatever. So anyway, uh, without further ado, we're gonna talk about these things up here. Now, one of the things that we recognize readily is the need to have engagement. We've worked with you today already a couple of times uh, and, and, and the idea is to have the participants engage and be involved in the learning. Be responsible for the learning, have some idea about what's going on and, and be actually working with the material. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to again number you one Two, one, two, one, one, two, one, two, right? We'll do, we do it just like we did this morning. And so as we do that, now this time we're not only going to have you uh, write about it, we're not only going to have you discuss it with your neighbor and rewrite about it, but we're going to have you put your answer on a sticky note, okay? And we're going to have you go to one of these three locations up here. One, two, you'll be the first ones, all right? You guys are a group, right? You guys, are, you, you guys will be that second location. And then uh, if we could stick one more paper up there, I think it's right underneath the, the seat. If we could put one right over there, we'll give you guys one, two, you'll be section three, and you'll be section four there at the end. Okay, we got another one back there just in case the bleed through might occur. Now we're going to do sticky notes so it won't, we don't need to double it. We're all right, we're all right. We're all right. I don't want to mess this nice new paint job up in here. I get myself in trouble. Uh, I stay in trouble most of the time, so, you know. Uh, this, is, uh, this is my life. Uh, been in special education for 35 years, and all those years ago when I went in that first special education class, I looked around and there was about 18 females and me and another guy. <laughs> and, and I said, you know, I think I'll just stay. <laughs> you know. So here I am all these years later. Now look around here. Compare yourself. There's the other guy back there behind the camera <laughs> and all these females. Hey, special ed, that's it, right? So um, I, like I said, I get in trouble a lot. They have to direct me. They have to lead me around, show me things, you know, how I mess up and all that. And then I go home and my wife's a 30-year kindergarten teacher and she tells me to line up for dinner, right? So anyway, uh, so right now I want you to think about accommodation, okay? I want you to think about your own jobs. I want you to think what you've done with accommodation. I want you to write your own ideas down, up, down about what accommodation is and I want you to come up with one example, okay? I want you to work on what is accommodation, 
What is accommodation? Okay, think about testing. We do accommodation for testing all the time, right? So what type of accommodation, what is accommodation? And, and I want you to come up with one example of how you've used an accommodation in your classroom activities. All of you have been in the classroom. All of you have worked with students. So I want you to reflect for a second. I want you to use your metacognitive processes and think, think, or use your cognitive processes and think back to what you've done in your classroom. Okay? So, once you formulate your answer in about a minute or so, then I want ones and twos to talk to one another. This time I want twos to tell ones what your answer is. Then I want you to go back and reconsider your own answer, see if you want to change it. And then I want you to go to your in-person jam board. Okay, if we were doing this virtually, you could do this virtually, and you'd have this little thing where you, you could do a sticky note and you'd just put it right up there on a page. You've probably seen that happen before uh, with virtual instruction, but we're going to do it in-person instruction. We, we call it, so we call it an in-person jam board, and we're going to have you guys go up and put your sticky note. We want everybody to get up and go to your location when you get finished, but you want to go through the engagement, and you're considering accommodation right now. We're considering accommodation and what it means and what's one example, and then we're going to have a little share session with each of you telling us what your things are. Oh. Brenda is providing a scaffold. Okay. Bre uh, Miss Brenda is a wily educator, and she knows lots of times what I need to have happen next, and she fills in the blanks for me. We do so much training together, she knows where to go. She completes my sentences. She t sh so, She's holding up the paraeducator guide that you've received and you might find some additional things in there to consider. Great little scaffold. Sometimes some of your students need a little nudge. They need a little scaffold. They need a little bridge. They need, and that's really what we're talking about here. Okay, so you should start having your conversations now and sharing your answers with one another. All right, we're going to be moving quickly because we're we got a lot of ground to cover, and I want y'all to get all the information before you leave. And I want you to move around a little bit so you won't fall asleep on the ride home. And to borrow a phrase from Anita Archer, I'm walking around, I'm looking around, I'm talking around. Help a student with the problem. Well, the problem I'm had a, okay. Right. Right. Exactly. Good example. Great example. That even temporarily sometimes you have to do that, right? Okay. All right. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So yeah, yeah. I want to. I'm doing student. Okay. Don't forget about your definition now. Oh. Definition of accommodation. What is an accommodation? Just in your own words. What do you? You know. How would you say that? This is the yeah. work. Good job. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, we, we pointed to the book. There's, there's a chapter in there on accommodation. There's a chapter in there on accommodation. Yeah. Um, I don't know what chapter it is. Chapter 7. Chapter 7. Okay. So we're looking around. We're talking around. We're walking around. Catering to that child's specific need. Oh, Lord, time I'll test. Good, 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 good. Good. I wrote to the no, you're good. You're good. All right. Now, as you are, um, have you shared your answers with one another? Share your answers with one another. Talk about it. I don't. I don't want you. I don't want you to have them read your sticky note. I want you to tell them. I want twos to tell ones or ones to tell twos, and then I want you to rethink what it is that that you've written and maybe add to or take away or recraft. Rewrite, reanalyze, and then we'll go to the board, right? And as you're thinking about this, I want you to think about your own students that you work with, and I want you to think about how I can take this back and incorporate that into my small group instruction that we heard talk about, how we could look at, look at the different modes of learning that a student may need, what, what is it that they need 
from an accommodation standpoint to help them get the gist of the lesson. Okay? Now, I'm hearing silence, so I'm taking that for it's time to go to the jam board. Okay? So let's move. Time to move. Go to the jam board as you finish up your answers. And I am moving you quickly. We, that's, another, that's another of Anita Archer's sayings. We're going to work perky, not pokey. Right? So we'll go to the jam board. We'll get up and we'll move. And we'll be invigorated and we'll get some more Mountain Dew. Stay over there. You ain't getting off the hook. Stay over there by your work. Claim that. Claim that area. All right, quickly. Quickly. No, stay over there. Stay over there. I'm hurting you. <laughs> All right. So we're going to start in reverse order over here with number four. Someone step up there with group four. Who's on group four? Identify yourself. Speak. Young lady, identify yourself and tell us what you're going to say about accommodation. What's the definition? What's an example? No sticking. Oh. I wrote to make a different arrangement to a child's specific needs. Okay. And? Partner? Yes. Okay, good deal. All right, over here. Okay, mine was anything that that child needs, you need to know. Okay. Is if that child needs constant assistance with everything, you uh -huh. need to know that it's there. Right, and understand, yes. Right, you need right. to be there, for whatever. Okay. So give me an example. You can give me the example. You had an example on your paper. I remember you had an example. Uh, Longer time on a test is an accommodation, right? Very good answer. So, let me ask you something. Is accommodation instruction? You think about that for a second. All right, let's go over here. Okay. It's an accommodation to assist them. Right. Okay. Exactly. Okay. All right. Okay. You're up. Mine was like if a child has a broken arm and you need to assist, maybe writing, help them with their sign. Exactly. An accommodation can be, hey, listen, accommodation can be a student has a problem with fine motor skills. Maybe they don't have the strength. Or maybe the pencil's too small and they can't manipulate their fingers to that size so you put a pencil grip on there. That's an accommodation, right? That's an accommodation, right? Okay, so what did you guys have on your alls um, over there? To assist students uh, with any kind of uh, work activities they have at school, such as, you know, uh, you can help them with maybe, we can give them encouragement, you can uh, help them with ideas. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. A re so you were reading for that student. And you, so you were, you were accommodating that student. That student maybe couldn't read the, the text and you read for that student. Okay. Certainly that is an example of an accommodation. Go ahead. Um, just the definition of my own work is to make things easier for a student who has issues. Just okay. Um, I like that. Uh -huh. We give her the top coat. It's a okay. top coat, so she didn't have to bend. And All right. Style. Perfect. Yeah. How about you? Do you have one? Uh, modify schoolwork. Okay. And things throughout the day. Okay. So, all right. So, everybody rush back to your seats because you're getting ready to hear a good story. Oh, I thought we was getting ready to go home. No. <laughs> we're not home yet. Not home time yet. We, got, we still got some things to do. Okay. So, I heard you guys say...
All right, so up here we see this. Accommodations are tools and procedures that help students participate in classroom instruction and activities, other school programs or services. Now that's straight out of the IRIS, okay? That's straight out of that IRIS module on accommodation. So it's any tool or procedure that helps the student participate, okay? So if you can think about leveling the playing field for a student, providing access to the learning, okay? Anything you're gonna do for that student that's gonna help them demonstrate what they know, they may have a disability, like you said, they may not be able to see very well, so we enlarge the print, right? Or they may not be able to hear very well, so we put on the auditory reader, right? So those are all those things that can help to provide equal access to the instruction and assessment for students with disabilities. They are provided to level the playing field, okay? And I'm not going to beat a dead horse, but that's what it is. That's what an accommodation is. And later we're going to talk about modification. There's a little bit of a difference between the two. Sometimes we interchange those words and we confuse them a little bit. But an accommodation is anything that, any tool or procedure that you're providing for that student that's going to level that playing field and provide them the opportunity to access the instruction and access the assessments that they're going to be given, okay? So, we might have some barriers to that. And some of those barriers might be um, how information is presented. As a text, we might, you know, uh, if, we're, if we're providing a lecture and the student uh, can't hear, we've got to provide the accommodation so that they can hear the lecture, right? If they can't see the video, then we have to provide them with uh, an explanation of what's going on in the video, right? Those kinds of things. So the characteristic of the setting, the manner in which students are asked to respond in writing through speech, the, uh, the levels of noise and lighting, the timing and scheduling of instruction, the time of day, the length of a given assignment, those are all things to consider when we're thinking about what are some barriers to instruction that accommodation can overcome. Okay. Brenda? Did you have any anything to interject there? They have um, students that participate in extracurricular activities. They also will get accommodations. Um, I know you probably heard about the, the football player that was deaf, uh, and he had to have accommodations because he had to understand what play they were running, those types of things. Um, so behavior could be an issue as well. If they go, if they play some type of sport, you know, the uh, coach needs to understand. And I think that happened to Denny Paul one year uh, with accommodations. Yes. Uh, when he was coaching. Uh, so that the coaches need to know if there's any type of accommodation that, that needs to be done while uh, they're, they're coaching that child. That's, a, that's exactly correct. And so, um, the teachers and the administrators are supposed to let everybody know if, if there's a particular accommodation that needs to occur, then everybody needs to know. Anybody that's involved with that student, whether it be curricular or extracurricular, like Brenda said. And so, uh, we look at this, and this is a little bit difficult to see, but I'm going to read it for you, okay? So, accommodations are tools and procedures that provide equitable access. Now, that word equity, we're going to talk about that in just a second. Uh, so, keep that in the, in the forefront of your mind. Accommodations are, a, are uh, changes to the education environment and practices designed to help students overcome the challenges that are presented by their disability. Okay? Think about um, closed captioning. Okay? Think about closed captioning. A student can't hear what's being said on television, but they can, they can watch the program and get the access to the program by seeing the words on the screen, right? What they also didn't realize with that universal design for learning approach was that they were also allowing me to watch Seinfeld at night without getting my ear chewed off by my wife, right? Because I'm keeping her awake. I can put on the closed caption. I can watch it and not interrupt her sleep, okay? So think about curb cuts. That's an accommodation, right? That's a universal design 
architectural design, it helped that person with the wheelchair get where they needed to get. But what about that mama with that baby in that buggy, in that baby buggy? You see what I'm saying? So lots of, lots of things can be used dually uh, as universal design, but what I want you to keep in mind is when we start to look at the difference between accommodation and modification, with this in mind, it's important to recognize that accommodations do not change what is learned or the expectation of the learning, but only provide some tools uh, and change how the student accesses the learning. Okay, so for example, if you tell the student or if you read for the student on their grade level and then you ask them questions about that reading and they can answer the questions at a high level, you've provided the access even though their disability keeps them from reading it themselves, you learn what they know, right? That's how it works on an assessment, right? We have, we know readers and scribes. We got kids that can't write physically, so we scribe for them. Uh, we know that uh, there's all types. We know that some students can't organize themselves, so they get extended time, right? Those are all examples of what we're talking about. So we're not changing what's learned or the expectation. We're not lowering the level of, or the expectation of the learning. We're just providing a bridge to the learning, okay? So that's an accommodation. Now, let's look at the modification section. And, and this goes a little deeper in this presentation. Um, so we say, we say accommodations do not change the expectations for learning. They do not re reduce the requirements of the task. And they do not change what the student is required to learn. So an accommodation is simply a tool to get access. It's to give that student equity. Equitable access is giving that student what they need when they need it. If we're given equal access, we're giving everybody the same thing, okay? So if we're, are we, uh, if we're going to do equality as opposed to equity, equality is going to be, all right, well, just give everybody a, a hearing aid. Well, that doesn't do anything, right? We only need to give the hearing aid to the person that has the hearing difficulty. That's equity, giving people what they need when they need it, okay? So... That, this accommodation thing is really um, a big part of what you guys do, right? Teachers should provide accommodations that meet the unique needs of each individual student. Not all students with the same disability or even those who experience the same barrier will benefit. For example, not all students with vision impairments will benefit from Braille materials, okay? I just told you that and now I've recapped it. There are some categories of accommodations. Up, oh, I jumped the gun here just a bit. Uh, it keeps wanting to jump on me. Okay, so presentation, we provide access to information by helping them read or by, requiring them, uh, or by not requiring them to read a text. So how do we present the information? How do we allow the student to respond to us? They, they respond by completing the assignment activities. Uh, think about a student that uh, you ask them to write um, a, a listing of all the attributes uh, in the story or all the details or the main idea and all the details under. Okay? And you got one student that can just do that, right? You read the story, they can just write the main idea and give you all. Or you've got a graphic organizer here that's got main idea up here that reminds them and then those details and maybe some keywords in between. So that graphic organizer provides them an accommodation that you wouldn't do with the other student who could, pos who could just do it on their own, right? So that's the kind of thing we're talking about. And then there's setting accommodations to, uh, where the assignment's being given. Uh, if a student uh, has autism, I know you just had a session on autism in here uh, just a few minutes ago or earlier today, and sometimes students with autism are easily distracted, right? Uh, the lighting's too bright. The buzzing that we hear, I don't know what that is, I don't know if that's what it is, but I can hear it right now. If that gets on my nerves to the point that I can't learn, then I've got to remove that. I've got to move the setting, right? I've got to move them down the hall. Or, or if they're with a group of people that's agitating them, we move, re remove them. So that's a setting accommodation. And then we have timing and scheduling accommodation. Increase the amount of time that a student... Now, sometimes a student, uh, if they 
uh, are having organization difficulties or they can't stay on task for very long because they're easily distracted, they need extended time, right? So we give them extended time. That's an accommodation, right? Okay, so those are the categories of accommodation. And then, um, so um, if we had lots of time, and, but we don't, we're running, we're running thin on time, I, I could tell you uh, we're going to just, we're, We'll look at all. We'll go ahead and look at this right here, though. Examples: visual impairment, reading, print, text. You can see the example of the accommodation. Uh, decoding text. You have audio book or a human reader. Um, we've kind of already gone over that. We've already gone over that. This is a just a, a vision uh, or a visual representation of how a qual you see a quality. If you give everybody the same box how it doesn't work for some, because some have different problems. See, this kid's shorter. He gets the same box, but he can't reach. But if we give the equity, we give what, what they need when they need it. See the difference? You get, this kid gets three boxes, so he gets up there. This kid gets two, and this one gets one. That's why when uh, somebody in the classroom says, uh, you know, uh, why are you doing this for this student? This is unfair. Well, it's not unfair because everybody's got different things that they need at different times, right? So that's the difference between equality and equity. Brenda? Yes, uh, that happens a lot in, in the classroom. You could, uh, some kids would say to me when I talk, uh, that's not fair. You're doing this, this, and this. Well, it is fair because we do have laws and regulations now that show us that we have to have an equal playing field. Um, we also have some regular education teachers that don't care too much for that uh, in their classroom. They, they still think that that's not fair that the special education kids are getting extra. They're not getting extra. We're doing what we can to level out that plane. So let's consider modifications now. Modifications are adaptations that change what students learn. Okay, so now we're talking about um, changing the difficulty, the, the, the breadth and the depth of what's learned. Okay, so we're going to modify instruction. We're thinking students that um, even with accommodations still can't get it. What classroom are we talking about most of the time here? We're talking about that, that, that self-contained classroom, that student has the most severe disabilities. And even with these accommodations, we've provided all the accommodations, but then they still are having difficulty with the concept. So we modify the content. We change the content. We change the expectation of the learning. We chunk into big rock concepts. We provide the access because we still do the accommodation. We still provide all the things that the student needs, but we also modify the content and the expectation is different. Does that make sense? Okay. So I know I'm hurrying through some things, but I, I want to get to this special design instruction stuff, okay? So unlike accommodations, modifications do change the expectation of the learning. They do reduce the requirements of the task. It alters the content or number of skills involved in a lesson. Whereas accommodations level the playing field, modifications change the playing field. Does that make sense? And in an FMD classroom, accommodations level that playing field and they still can't get it. So then we get to this part and we have to modify. And it's those students that are still not getting it even after we modify that end up with an alternate assessment. Okay? A very low percentage of the student population is expected to be on alternate assessment. We don't just put students on alternate assessment just because they're in a particular disability category. We have to go through these. We provide all the accommodations to level the playing field. We modify and they're still having difficulty. You see what I'm saying? About 1% or less of your population. All right? So, 
we've talked about accommodation. We've talked about modification. I asked the question a minute ago. You remember you were standing over there? And if we had time, I would have taken you through the engagement cycle again, let you do modification the same way, and then we would do special design instruction the same way. But we're running, th we're running thin on time. You guys are tired. I can see it in your eyes. We've had a long day. You, it's been, we've thrown a lot at you, have we not? But here's the thing. I asked this question. I said, is accommodation instruction? Some of you went. Right, okay. Some of you said yes, some of you said no, some of you some in, in, in between. I don't, I'm not acting like I know it all. I had to learn this and study this too, okay? Accommodation is level in that playing field, providing, but that's not really instruction, okay? We're, what we're, when we talk about specially designed instruction, we ask the teachers to consider, hey, what are some of the things that you do that are different than the regular classroom teacher that are special? If somebody walked in off the street and brought their kid to you and you wanted them to sign in to special ed after they'd been evaluated and all the proper, and you know, they meet the criteria and they, you know, they need the special design instruction, they, they you know, do all those things that, that enables them to be eligible for the services, and then they look at you and say, well, what's so special about what you do? Can you answer that? Can you answer that question? And so a lot of the books that I've read on special design instruction talks about the federal definition, adapt the content and the methodology to ensure access to the curriculum, to make sure that students can meet the level of the standards. That's the definition. Well, what the heck? What does that mean? We don't know what that means, right? Sometimes that's, we're going to adapt the content and the methods. And we're going to do something different. Okay, so what are those things? What are those things? So right there it is. To meet the unique needs of the child in, in order to have them get access to the instruction and to be able to do the standard, to meet the level of the standard. So in order to be in special education, you have to not only have a disability, but you also have to need special design instruction because the gap between where you're functioning and where you're expected to be functioning in the standards are so different. So you need special design instruction. Example, you got a kid that's got ADHD. Doctor provides medicine, the student no longer has ADHD, they still have a disability, and all the rights that go with that under the umbrella of 504, but do they need special design instruction? No, they're doing okay. They don't need special design instruction, they just need the medicine, right? But they still qualify for 504 protection. They may need a little extended time or whatever to finish their lessons because of their distractibility and because the medicine don't always work exactly the way it's supposed to. But they don't need special design instruction. Those students that need special design instruction need that because they are in a situation where their functioning level right now is significantly behind their same age peer. Okay? And so we get specially designed instruction. And it's different from anything you see in the regular classroom. It's more intense. So let's go on down here. And if we had time, we'd do this guided question, what does this really look like in your school? But this is really what it means, to change the order of the content, to maybe look for an alternative text, low, high interest, low readability, Right? You, you know about those books? Uh, can we eliminate sections of the content? By eliminating some content, we'll be able to focus on key concepts. And some students need expanded core curriculum, including Braille, mobility training, and sign language or self-advocacy training. Okay? So there's lots of things that students will need because of their disability, because they're so far behind. So, when we adapt methodology, this is the teaching part, the methods that we use that are different from the regular methods. We examine student history and evaluation results. We know what the learning profile is. We know what, how they best learn. Remember we talked about strengths and needs this morning? We, we look at that and we look at do they need intensive phonemic awareness instruction? Do they need multi-sensory methods to comprehend? That was one we talked about this morning, right? To comprehend new vocabulary. Do they need an alternate math strategy? 
guided study skills, notes, scaffold graphic organizers, forced engagement, intensive small group instruction with a, a decrease in pacing where we slow things down. That's special design instruction. Okay? Now, I'm going to go ahead because we're getting really close to the end here. Why should we focus on special design instruction? We are supposed to focus on special design instruction because we're supposed to meet the unique needs of the student with the disability. That's why they're in special ed. We're supposed to ensure access to the general education. We promise or guarantee. Ensure means to promise or guarantee that the student has access. We have inclusive, uh, inclusive settings that help. We can't teach a child to swim by taking them out of the pool, but you also cannot teach them by just throwing them back in the pool. So what we're talking about there is we, we teach them right there in the classroom, right? Most of the time. That's where they get most access to the instruction. We meet the standards that are there for the student, and it's all about instruction, not accommodation. That's what's special. So the, the guiding questions that we would ask, is it special? Is it different from universal design for learning? We're, we're just providing students a different way of accessing the information. Or we've differentiated the activity in the classroom. All students get that through tiered activities in RTI. But special needs students get something more. Okay? Does it address the student's unique needs? Has it been planned? Has it been thought out? Have we gotten the materials ahead? Like Dion was taking you through the small group uh, ses session in there just a minute ago and I was watching. Have we intentionally planned and brought in the graphic organizers? Do we have the little uh, share caddy, uh, shower caddy, I should say. Share, I'm, I'm a hillbilly, I'm sorry. And we've got all the things that are needed for that student to have access and that we can teach them. Have we planned it? Have we intentionally looked at it? Have we looked at the design, looked at the results, and then redesigned our lesson? for what the students need. Because that's what special design instruction is. It's focusing on what they need. It's addressing their unique needs. It's related to the IEP. We're going to progress data collect to inform us. It's an instruction. Uh, it, is, it, it is instruction rather than a tool or an accommodation. It's intentional. It's designed to bring the progress. It's a growing a skill that can be generalized to other settings. If you teach a skill, uh, can they just do it in the classroom or can they take it down the hall and use it? Can they take it home and use it? Can they take it to church and use it? You see what I'm saying? So is it building independence? So it, the special design instruction is, um, is so what we do as special education teachers. And you guys as paraeducators, once that special design instruction has been introduced and once that lesson has been taught the first time, you can go to town with it. You can teach it. You can do it yourself, right? You sometimes are the best thing that ever happened to that child, okay? I promise you I know that, okay? Once that SDI has been delivered one time, you can go to town with it. And so I come to my top five, and this is the end of, uh, of today, and I've got some things uh, attached there that you can see. I was going to let you watch the video, but I don't know if we're going to have time because it's 2.57. So... Explicit instruction. I've given you some things to think about today. Anita Archer. She's uh, one of the best teachers I've ever run across in all my 35 years. I was able to spend a lot of time with her, about nine days of, of training I had with her. She talked about designing the lesson so that the student knows where they're going. Okay? The target's clear. And it's explicitly communicated to the student. Okay? Explicit instruction. Then we, once we, we, do the, we do it one time for them, we model it for them one time. I do it, and then we do it together a bunch of times. Dion said about 27 times is what a special needs student typically needs repetition. That's how many reps they need to get something down that's new. Whereas a, a student uh, that has just a typical intellect might only need seven times of repeating, right? Humans learn by repeating and getting good feedback from adults. Students learn from, you see what I'm saying? So explicit instruction, repetition and feedback,
providing examples and non-examples. We went through the Freyer model in there. On one side you had examples. On one side you had non-examples. We were doing parallel lines. Parallel lines don't cross. Non-example would be an intersection, right? Or right angle. So, and then once we, we do it, we do it, we finally gradually release and pull those uh, graphic organizers. We pull those uh, uh, accommodations away and we allow them to do it themselves independently. So I do it, we do it, you do it. Anita Archer, okay? Explicit instruction. Yes. Also with Anita Archer, remember that you have to break it up. You have to take whatever the content is and break it up into smaller pieces. Yeah. Some of her students need it broken down very small. Yeah, we just, so we just talked about that. that. Make sure you're doing yeah. that part. Thank you. Yeah, we just, talk, we just talked about that narrowing and when we do accommodation and then we do modification and we still need to provide more. I'm talking about just when we start with the beginning yeah. the instructions, no break question. it down as small yeah. as you can because for many of our students, especially that FMD population, which you guys probably serve, you need to know that they can only chunk so much at a time. And so when you overload them with multiple steps, especially like algorithms and those kind of things, we lose them. Thank you, Stephanie. I appreciate that. Um, so then getting high levels of response through our engagement cycle. We were doing thinking, reading, writing, sharing, discussing, calling out, right? Retrieval of information from a blank slate. We've not talked a lot about that. A lot of our kids have memory issues. You have to get them practicing giving you information back as early as you can do it. Giving them so it's it sometimes referred to as a cold call. It's not really that what it is, but like if I talked to you this I talked to you this morning about what? What was the topic? What was the topic? See what I'm saying? You bring that for, you don't have it written down. What was the first topic? Confidentiality, right? Second second topic this morning was what? What was the second one we talked about? PM. Progress monitoring. All right? And then this last one's accommodation modification and SDI. So in order to get students to think about what they've learned, we ask them to, to give us that information back readily, a bunch. What did you learn yesterday? Can you tell me two things you learned yesterday? What did you learn in the last class? Write me two things down. And you get them to practicing that because they need help with their memory. Do they not? Our students have problems with memory. So that's another big one as far as special design instruction. And then metacognitive strategies, I had a whole daggone thing about that. I'm not going to get to it, but I've got you some handouts over here before you leave with a bunch of different types of graphic organizers that you can use in your classrooms. They're right there on the end of the table, Dion. And, um, and then if you think about metacognitive, what is metacognitive? It's a big word, mean, meaning we reflect and think and we can organize and think about what we're learning. We can activate our own prior knowledge. We can think about reading comprehension when we're reading a story. What did we learn? Who's the villain? What's going to happen next? We can predict. We can recall. We can do all those things. And right attached to the very end of this is a video on George Costanza. I told you I love Seinfeld. Okay. Anything you do in this, this life, you can relate it to a Seinfeld episode, okay? George one time decided that he had been doing all things wrong in his life. He was reflecting on his decisions. So he decided that he was going to do just the opposite of what he thought he should do. That's metacognition. You guys remember the episode? It's the, it's the summer of George. He's going to do the opposite. So instead of sitting there... And not, um, the video was like, uh, oh, well, I'll just, uh, this, this pretty girl looked over at him. He's bald, he's short, he's fat, he's this, he's that. And he says, you know what, all my life I've sit here and I wanted to go speak to her, but I wouldn't. So this time I'm going to do the opposite. He goes over and of course you know what happens. She falls in love with him. But that, that doing the opposite and having the ability to think about what you've done in your life or what you've learned, or organizing what you've learned, 
or being able to set goals and advocate for yourself all has to do with metacognitive strategy. So those are your five, uh, my top five for special design instruction. And those are the things that you would be supporting uh, after the teacher provides that first lesson. And then you can just do the repetition, do the feedback, and have them give you the information back readily.